let me ask you all this question, okay? And, and I'm gonna I'm gonna start with you, uh, uh, Doc. When you <laughs> when you were when you were growing up, mm-hmm. what did you want to be? A mechanic. A mechanic. Why'd you want to be? A, why'd you want to be a mechanic? Because um, I was around some guys uh, around my godmother's house on Grat Street. And every time I walked past this guy's shop, he had this 57 red Chevy, mm-hmm. immaculate. The uh, Craig rims on there. He was, he was fixing, always tuning up. And then I, I finally met the guy later in life. He worked for SEPTA. And I'm like, yo, is that your car right there where um, the beer distributor right there is on 66 and Ogons? He's like, yeah, that's my other yo. I used to walk past that car every time I go to my godmother's house. And the guy, the Puerto Rican guy that worked on this car, he taught me how to change oil. And he taught me how to change different parts of the cars. And then there was a guy on my block. He turned me on to change, uh, fixing cars and all that type of stuff. And he let me drive his, his deuce and a quarter. I've never drove a car like that in my life. Man, that's that's where I, I got on to wanting to be a mechanic, man, as far mechanic, as you know. Huh? Median, so what did you want to be when you were growing up, man? Like, what did you want to be? It was two things I wanted to be. I wanted to be a chef or I wanted to do comedy. At a very really? Age. Yeah, and what, age, what age was that? Uh, man, I was probably 10, 11, 12, somewhere around that. Because we was poor, so I had to make stuff in the kitchen. Mm-hmm. So I started thinking I was like a chef because I could take a sandwich, some bread, and some sugar, and some mayonnaise and some bologna, you know what I mean? I make, I make, and some lettuce. You give me some lettuce, I make it work. And I start thinking, you know, that I was a chef. So when I went to school, I took all them junior chef classes. So that's what was my first love. So I got a job in a restaurant, and I was making two twenty five an hour. I never forget that. Not a deuce and a quarter. It was two twenty five an hour. <laughs> and I was a broiler cook, and I was like, I can't do this because we were working like 12, 13 hours. Like, mm, this ain't gonna work out for me, bro. Right? You know what I mean? <laughs> so the comedy thing came. Basically, because I was so small, when I graduated high school, I was only five six, and I was ninety eight pounds. Mm-hmm. So you had to be funny, you know what I'm saying? So I was always just funny, you know, just naturally. Just I always learned. I knew I used to do Rudy Ray Moore jokes, Richard Pryor. I knew all that stuff, you know, from the top of my head. But I, that was one of the two things I wanted to do. Either one of those things, man. And either one. Now I still cook a lot. Yeah, love cooking, but comedy definitely was my passion. I just took a forty year break. What did you want to be when you grew up, Donald? <laughs> yeah, so just I just data entry computer. I wanted it was something related in the computer field, and yep. then I I actually had an opportunity to uh, for like I said for about seven years I had my own computer repair business. Um, At what age was that? Did you decide that you know you wanted to be a computer you know data analyst? I'm sorry. Oh, like in high school, like if you go into our yearbook and it tells you what your future, uh, you know they say what you think you're going to be. If you look to our names where it says, it's going to say something about data entry or some type of computer field. There was something in computers that I, I was always fascinated by the computers. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay. Old soul. Uh, actually, it was two things I wanted to be when I was growing up. First was I wanted to be a baseball player. Um, I remember sitting down my, you know, when I was young and me and my mom used to watch. Uh, she loved the Phillies, loved the Phillies. And uh, we used to sit down and watch games every Sunday. Mm-hmm. And between that and, you know, my dad buying me a Johnny Bench warm uh, batter up, um, I just had to, you know, I wanted to be a baseball player, man. It was everything about, I knew about baseball before I knew about anything else. So that was my first thing. And the other thing, believe it or not, was uh, a pastor. I wanted to be a pastor. Wow, wow. Um, you know, my mother used to have Martin Luther King albums around the house. And she used to also, I don't know, everybody that's our age, but Reverend Ike, she was, yeah, I know Reverend he Ike. was completely in a Reverend Ike, right? And mm-hmm. I was just amazed how uh, a minister can just captivate, the right minister could captivate somebody and just hold that attention. But when I realized that, well, I didn't realize, you know, I didn't know as far as the whole marriage thing and the woman thing and then the premarital sex and all that. Once I realized that, I was like, well, that's, you know, can't do that. <laughs> Um, so I just kind of, I kind of followed my dreams in the sports. So that was, that was, that was pretty much it for me. Word. Baller. How about you, man? Actually just, uh, two things, like a couple of the other guys, uh, I wanted to play professional basketball 
and I also wanted to be in law enforcement, something with law. At what age was this, though? Well, basketball was ever since I was 10 years old. 10 years old. And um, law enforcement? Law enforcement, I want to say I was maybe 17. So, so, uh, Baller, you said when you was young, you wanted to be a, a basketball player? Yeah, I wanted to play professional ball. Yeah. When I was growing up, um, you know, I, I think I, I think I wanted to be a basketball player because, you know, all I saw was sports on there, you know, football, baseball, and basketball. Basketball was my thing. I mean, we I played basketball on, you know, crates growing up, running full courts on the crates, you know, growing up back in the day. And for me, it was all about – I could be a professional ball player and make some money, <laughs> right? Look, that's what I thought. Um, and then when I started going, you know, after high school, getting into high school, I was like, I had all kinds of things I wanted to be. I wanted to be a accountant. I wanted to be an engineer. Uh, I wanted to be, <laughs> I did economics. I'm thinking, look, they all relate to money. So I'm going to go ahead and try those for careers. Um, I asked you all this question. What did you want to be? when you were growing up, like back in the day to ask you this question. We're, Cause we're all older now, right? right. We're all older now. So given that we're all older right now, let's take money out of the picture, right? Take money out of the picture. If you could have any job in the world, what would that job be and why? That's the question I want to ask you, right? Knowing all the things that we've learned over the years, all the experiences we've had, if you could have any job in the world, what would it be and why? And, and so I want to ask you all that question. If you could have any job in the world, what would it be and why? Donald, I'll start with you. If you could have any job in the, be, in the world, what would it be and why? Well, any job in the world, I would want to be a counselor. And I do a lot of mentoring, and especially in our community. And if it, since it's not a based on money, you know, counselors don't get paid a lot of money. Um, but I would like to be able to change the direction or the trajectory of individuals' lives based on my own experiences. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that I'm actually doing in my part time. But if I could make the money that I'm making now and make that a full time position where I could support my family, that I believe that I could change thousands of lives. Comedian. Yeah. If you could if you could have any job in the world, what would it be and why? Exactly what I'm doing right now. Comedy. Without a doubt. Um it's always been in me that the ability, and say something else, like growing up and being small and always wanting to always kind of be the underdog. You know, I've always been the underdog most of my life. But when you're on stage in comedy, it's just you. You know what I mean? There's no underdog. It's everything is made. I get to do that. My size got nothing to do with it. It's my ability at that point. But not only does comedy allow me that, it allows me to uplift people. Mm. And I can get words to people by using comedy easily. I know that my gifting from God has been my ability to communicate. And now I use that communication to help with like PTSD vets, uh, raising money for patriotic set results. But the comedy is the basis of it that does it for me. So everything I want to do in life, the people I want to touch, you know what I mean? I can do it through comedy and I wouldn't change nothing about my life because then that changes the people who are in my life. So I'm going to stick right where I'm at doing what I'm doing. You know, of course, I'd rather be bigger than I am. Right. If I had one job to pick, it still would be definitely stand up. Oh, so how about you, man? If you could have any job in the world, what would it be and why? Uh, probably something related to sports, sports management you know, uh, in the administration of sports because I like sports. Um, but also my, you know, what I'm doing right now, I'm, I'm involved in management, but I would like to do it on the other end as far as something that I really, really care about and love, not to say that I don't love my job, but, you know, sports is just something that's near to me. You know what I mean? Organizing, putting people together for a common goal, a common cause. Um, I just love it. You know what I mean? I love doing it. I love, you know, the organization and stuff like that. Um, I would love to get involved in this. I would have loved to get, in, you know, got involved in something like that 
um, kind of piggyback off of Donald if I would have followed up and gotten into the whole coaching. I did that for maybe a year um, with Pop Warner football. Um, I didn't really have the experience that I needed. I wish I would have had more experience. Mm -hmm. But again, it's all building foundation on sports related uh, management and stuff behind the scenes. What puts a whole what puts a team together, um, travel, I mean, salaries, things like that. Just putting it all together. Doc, how about you, uh, Doc? If you could have any job in the world, what 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 would it be and why? But um, I'll say this: I'm gonna go back to when Carl started being a CSR downtown. His job when he got that, that job down there, mm -hmm. and just to see the people um, <coughs> facial expressions when you give them the information that they need. Um, like when I'm downtown and you have a foreigner come down, you have somebody that don't know where they're going. I like to give them that information and just to see that, just to see their their joy on their face. That like, okay, cool. This guy gave me the right information. I'm going to this place, and he helped me out a whole lot. So I would, I would, I would like to do. I would like to have done that when he did it because I think I would have, I'd still be there in that same position of helping people out with that. Comedian, what you wanted to be when you were growing up and now is still the same. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, but it took a, it was a gap about forty years in between that. Yeah, why do you think that was? Like, what do you think that the, because, the gap was there? Because life happens. You know, mm -hmm. we have a dream, of what we want to do, and then we also got to pay bills and do all this other stuff, and raise families, and we do all that, and we wish we could combine what we love and it pays the bills, right? But many times it doesn't, mm -hmm. and I just kind of took a sabbatical, basically from comedy, because I went to high school for comedy. I went to school for performing arts. Mm -hmm. I graduated from a performing arts school. So then in 78, when I joined the Marine Corps until I was mm -hmm. 53 years old is when I started back in the comedy. Mm -hmm. So I graduated at 18. And when I was 53 is when I went back in, but it was always burning in me. You know what I mean? It was always there. It was always there. And many days I woke up about doing comedy. And then one day at 53 years old, I sat on the side of the bed and I said, you know what? I'm going to do this before I die. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I haven't looked back since. You know what I mean? So it, the fire was always there. The fire never went out. You know what I mean? Even through the crazy Marine Corps days and all the crazy stuff we did. I always still made people laugh throughout that time when I was an instructor at the school in San Diego. That was my best years. I think that's what really re-inspired me to do comedy was getting on the stage and I would teach and them class was so dry, I had to make them fun. Yeah. And no instructors was doing that, trust me, in the rank or that. So they was like, looking at me like sideways, like, hey, you got to what you're doing. But the, the, the students loved it because they got a break of that monotony. And when I got done with that, I think that fire just re, you know, ignited and I was ready to jump back in, man. So, so Baller, if you could have any job in the world, what would it be and why? A producer, movie director. And the reason why I would like to change I would have changed in making movies. The movies that we've saw before where it depicted white people were black. No, I, I would show clearly black people. Like, let's say uh, uh, the uh, Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. As we all have read, the Bible depicts Jesus as a black man. I'm changing the whole scheme to put Jesus as a black man. Everybody's black. You know, so I want to change. I would have wanted to change history of the way the white man gave it to us. Right. I would portray my, my nigga. <laughs> <laughs> here you go. Baller, here you go. Ah, ah, look, look, look. look at that facial expression. You upset that young man there. Yeah. You know, listen, but I asked. So let me ask. Let me tell you why I talk about this topic, guys. For me, um, I think I run along the lines of Donald. Um, if I could be anything in the world, and I'm kind of, there's three things that I want to do and, and it's, it's dual purpose, right? Um, coaching, counseling, coaching slash counseling, writing and public speaking, right? Um, and the That's reason, four things. No, 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 no. Coaching slash counseling is one and the same, I guess. Is what you know, coaching slash counseling is one and the same, is what I'm trying to say, right? And, I, and I'm saying it because of this. Uh, the, the reason for the writing and and the 
the uh, public speaking is to support the coaching, right? From a business perspective, but why would I want to do coaching and counseling? I'd want to focus on coaching and counseling of high school and college students, right? Because when I was growing up, dude, I had very little direction in, in what I wanted to do, right? I, I ended up majoring in four different majors, right? Before I ended up ultimately graduating 10 years later. And it, it <laughs> you know, when I look back, it wasn't until 2009 that I decided, wow, this is really what I want to do and what I should be doing. Like, this is my purpose in life. And I think that, I think we're all here for, uh, we're all here for a reason, right? That's that's what I truly believe. I think we're all here for a reason. And and someone asked me today. I was talking to a student today at uh, PNLU, and they were like, "So, what does success mean to you?" <laughs> and I laugh, right? Because that's my thing. Like, oh, you coming in my space, right? Success. Well, success means something different to everyone. Uh, quite frankly, that's what I believe. But if you're asking me, um, I'm going to define it for you this way. Like, I believe that success is being happy at what you do and making an impact in this world. That's my belief. Being happy at what you do and making an impact in this world, right? And, and I wanted to have this conversation with you all because oftentimes I think that when we, you know, like when I look back at the guidance I received, but the guidance that I got was, you know, I was listening to everybody else's opinion. You should do this. You should do that. Right. A lot of, a lot of kids today are getting opinions from their parents on what they should do. Um, their parents are telling a lot of kids, parents are telling them what to do. Um, and we're not really being authentic to who we are as individuals most of the time. And we start going in directions only to find out years and years later that, whoa, I'm going in the wrong direction. And so, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to talk to you all to find out, you know, like, what are you doing now that you find to be purposeful in the world and making an impact, right? Because how can we continue to guide, like we as a group of individuals, like we all have skills, talents, and knowledge, but how can we continue to guide and educate so that, people can be authentic to whom they are early in their lives or find out who they are as early as possible. It's it, don't get me wrong. It's okay. Like, you know, I'm happy where I'm at, right? I'm happy where I'm at because I can now share these experiences, but how can we help continue to guide in what each of us are doing so that people can find out what their purpose is in life. One of you said, I, I apologize. One of you said, you know, money's an issue. Like, I, you know, I got to still make money to do what I'm doing though, right? So I'm doing it part-time. And that's part of the problem. We get so caught up in all these materialistic things that we get ourselves behind financially. Now we got to just take jobs to make sure we're taking care of things financially as opposed to following the things that we really love to do. And so we sacrifice and ultimately I'll be career coaching full-time, 100%. Like that's where I'm going to be. And I'm starting to make those sacrifices right now. Like I'm letting things go, taking care of bills, trying to pay my home off so I can do these things full-time right now. To, to a comedian's point, do what he's doing from a comedian side. You, you, you about to retire, baby. Ain't that right? You about to go out comedian, comedian full-time and just do your thing, right? And that's what that's what I want to do, right? In the next couple of years. And I want to ask you all, like, how do we help others achieve that goal? Communication. Definitely it's communicating. It's more than that though, Doc. It's more than communication though. Go ahead. Well, I mean, if we're if we're, if we're talking to that child and, and giving them information of asking them those questions of like, you know, what is your goal in life? And how are you? Uh, how are you able to obtain those goals? I, I actually got to kind of disagree. Not necessarily what's your goal. What does your mm -hmm. heart beat for? What do you love? What makes you want to move left or right? You know what inspires you? You know sometimes that necessarily may not be the goal, but I love to do it, and I can make that process to be that. You know, 
because there was a time that I loved to cook. I still do, but it moved me to want to cook for people, a lot of people, you know, but again, that wasn't my goal that I wanted to do career wise, you know, but you have to ask that person, you know, what do you love? What, what's going to move you? Because if you don't love something, it's going to fade. You know, right. what I'm, I'm doing it because my mom did it. My dad did it. Well, our family, this is what our family business was or whatever, you know, it is, but it's not moving me. I got a, a 15 year old son that lives with me. It'd be 16 February. Um, I have been talking to him about what he wanted to do probably for five years. And it wasn't until recently. And now no matter what you say, until they got it, until they get it, is when it, it's kind of like dealing with a drug addict that smokes crack. You can do everything you can to help them, but until they want to stop smoking, it don't stop. Mm -hmm. So until these young people decide what they want to do, we can give them guidance and direction. But until they buy into it, you know what I'm saying? When they buy into it, then changes happen, things happen. But I try not to push my son one way or another. I want to give him some guidance so he knows where he wants to go, then I'll support that. You know what I mean? But these young people, they are getting so much information these days from outside sources that make parenting some work, let me tell you. Because we, you know, we are battling the, outs, the, 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 the internet and all the stuff that you and I didn't have to deal with. But these young people get hit, boom, boom, boom. I mean, it's, it's a barrage, you know what I mean? So let's pause for a quick second. Donald, I know you want to go. I know you, I know you egging on to go, baby. Um, comedian, how do we get, how do we get, how do we get individuals? To, I agree with you. Like, how do we get individuals to buy into it, comedian? Kind of what, what Doc said is, is us guiding and counseling, not telling them. You see what I mean? You got to make them feel that this is a team effort, not just dad telling son, you need to do this. I right. would never do that. See, my son don't know to this day how much stuff I have manipulated him into. He has no idea. But I know how to do it smoothly where he doesn't even see it. Then when they wake up like, wow, now I'm this cool guy at school and I'm doing this and I'm doing that. He had no idea that I put that plan in effect. But Hopefully I, he doesn't watch this podcast. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> what he does feel is he's a part of the decision-making process. And that's important for young people. That is important. Um, they're, they're part of it, not us telling them. Donna, what were you going to say? Okay. I have a completely different perspective on this topic. And the reason why I have a different perspective is because of how long I've been uh, mentoring and coaching these kids. What, I, what I've found over the years is that it doesn't make a difference what the parents tell the kids or how the parents influence the kids. Mm -hmm. Because every single one of us had a vision of how our life was going to turn out but none of those things actually planned out the way we thought they were going to do. They, so the, the, the main theme is, is to lay a foundation. We lay the foundation so that the kids understand that it's okay not to know. It's okay to go into your senior year in high school and be undecided on what college you're going to go to or what field you're going to go into. And so I'm in full transparency. I'm always about full transparency. So I tell them, that out of the 30 plus people that I have working for me, there's only three out of the 30 that all have bachelor's degrees that are actually working in the field that they went to school for. Right. So I don't care if you go to school and you get your degree in typewriter maintenance. I'm telling you that it doesn't really make a difference unless you have a detailed plan and you are so focused on your plan that from the age of 15 or 16, you know what you want it to be and you knew how to accomplish that goal. I have a young lady at Stanford. She knew exactly what she wanted to be. Mm -hmm. She has a full academic rod at Stanford. When she comes out, she already has her plan. It's been laid out, right? Because, if you, because whatever plan you make, you have to be able to adapt and adjust on the fly. Let me, can I pause like you for a moment? Can I pause yes, you for a moment? So let me just interject and ask you this question though. So what about the individual, like college is expensive, bro. It is. And community colleges are becoming expensive now. Colleges can come up, you know, they can, some schools can be 40,000, 50, 60,000, 70,000 a year. And so yeah. giving your train of thought, and bear with me a moment here, giving your train of thought as someone who's worked directly with college students who have come to me in their junior year and be like, I want to change my major. 
because mm. they're, they're not sure what they want to do. How about that expense to the parents? I mean, how does that play out in your scenario of not, it's okay not knowing, it's okay not knowing what you want to do in, the, in high school going into college. I'm not saying I disagree with you. I'm just asking to no, spell it out for me, given the call. No, I'm going to spell it out. I'm going to give you, I'm, I'm going to be transparent because I want to talk about my own daughter, right? So yeah. um, when uh, her senior year, right, I'm trying to get her to decide what she wants to be, right? So, so I'm putting all this pressure on her to the point where she was actually crying in the dining room, right? Mm -hmm. She Then she decided. Then her going into her sophomore year, she realized that she did not like the major that she chose and she wanted to change her major, right? And when she called me and told me this, and so of course I started fussing because I said, this is what I was talking about. You should have been sure, blah, 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 blah. But then again, I realized life happens. So she changed her major. And at an expense to us, the major that she changed to, it was going to require her to take another, you know, finish out the two years plus an additional six months, right? Mm -hmm. Which was going to add an additional seven to $10,000 to what we were already paying. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about, she got a, it's, the school that she went to was $200,000. She mm -hmm. got a $120,000 scholarship. We got $80,000 in loans. I'm paying back $100,000 right now with interest. Mm -hmm. She graduated from, she graduated in 2018. They let her, they let her attend graduation in May, but she didn't finish until December. Okay. She was devastated. She was devastated. Yeah. And you know what I had to do? I had to call her and I had said, listen, this is, this is God's plan. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make a difference what you want or where you thought you were going to be because you have to be able to adapt. You have to be able to adjust and you have to have the foundation to do so. And all my kids that are in college now, and they haven't been able to play basketball. They got basketball scholarships. This is how I'm spending it. You got an extra year of eligibility. So that means you're yeah. going to be working for free one extra year towards your master's. So that's how you, so that's how you spend it. Right. I got another kid that her mom is in her ear constantly about you shouldn't go here. You shouldn't go here. And I, and it caught the kid called me crying, frustrated. I said, don't worry about mom. I'll take care of mom. You just listen and nod your head. Yes, mom. Yes, mom. And then my, me and mom will have a conversation. So I will lay out the exact reasoning why we're going to a two-year JUCO and then transfer into a four-year school. I'm laying it out because the kid cannot articulate what they're trying to accomplish. And lastly, my, I had been coaching my daughter since she was seven. Mm -hmm. It got to a point where she no longer heard my voice. Mm -hmm. So I have people in my life that we all speak with one voice. So I had the them individual coaches and mentors speak to her directly. And she didn't know that I was feeding them the information that I wanted them to feed her so that she could receive it, yeah. even though it was coming from me. So sometimes you have to change the voice in the room in order to get your point across. And then you have to bring people back we bring girls back to play professional ball. We bring girls back that's been the WNBA. We bring girls back that just graduated and is working a regular job to tell them that, you know, it ain't all that it's cracked up to be. And then lastly, we promote college. At my institution, we promote college. Our team GPA is 3.4, team GPA. If you have one C, you have, you have to be in study hall. We promote academic excellence, Yeah. okay? And the reason why we do that is because we want to prepare the child. If you blow your ACL and you can no longer play basketball and they take your scholarship, and if you get an academic scholarship, they can't take it away. So let, let me, let, and so I, I think you make all valid points. And this brings, this is why I'm having this discussion, right? What are your, what, what year are the ages of your kids? What grade levels? I have them as early as fifth grade all the way to uh, from basically from like seven, eight, nine years old to, to uh, 18. Yeah. So one of the things that I'm really practicing in my, in my world fellas is, so I agree with you. Not every, not every high schooler needs to come out knowing exactly what they, you know, should be doing, but know this, when you do go to college, not knowing what you want to do, you should probably start out in a, 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 a JC, right? before you go into a four-year college, just for the fact of the cost. Because if you go into a four-year college, then you start changing majors and majors, and that cost just gets exponentially higher, right? 
And now you're coming out with so much debt. And colleges, granted, colleges may change the way you think. Like we, COVID may force force colleges to do things differently and, and cost to be different. But I truly believe what's lacking in the communities right now, especially in the black community, even as black parents, is us introducing to our children at a young age the world of work, right? Like kids don't know what an engineer is. Like they don't know what certain things are. So the earlier we can intervene and take them to, you know, come to work day, right? Like career day and see what the careers are like. They start to get an idea of what's happening even at a young age and then start introducing them to, to individuals in the workforce and doing kind of what you call exploration learning about different uh, professions, occupations, then I believe that children will, as they go through high school, be ready to start make decisions because they've learned about careers and interests at a very young age, starting right out of, you know, starting in elementary, right? And, and there's a way to do that. So how can we, how can we educate youth on, and when I say youth, I'm talking about at the elementary level, how can we intervene into the communities and make these changes? How can we tell, tell parents to go out there and take your kids to, 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 to work on career day or bring them to work so they can see what you do? And, I, and maybe every parent can't do that, but there, there has to be organizations, and I know of organizations here in California that support it, so there has to be organizations in Philadelphia that supports it, and if there aren't, how do we create organizations in Philadelphia that does it so that we can help these kids understand what the world of work is about? Like, how do we do that? Let me, uh, I don't know, I'm gonna jump in a little bit on like kind of different layers. I'll take a little bit from everybody. Uh, for me and, and, and other podcasts, I've always mentioned my father because that's where I learned my work, my work ethic from, right? Um, so it starts with, first of all, it starts with positive reinforcement and positive encouragement. One of the problems, and, and I'm going to put out there, one of the problems we have in the Black community is that sometimes we are dream killers, right? Mm -hmm. You're too sure, you're this, no, you shouldn't be, listen. My granddaughter just turned 14 years old. She wrote like a novel, just off the top of the dome, right? She did like a novel type of comic book, just right off the top, top of the dome. So it's up to us as her grandparents, her parents and her mother, it's constantly positive reinforcement, right? Whatever the tools they need. Now, I say that to say this, when I started working in the workforce, there, Philadelphia used to have something called Mayor Summer Youth Program um, in the Wilson Good Administration. I got involved with that, which taught me how that was like literally my first supervising job, right? So it taught me how to supervise, how to talk to people, how to, how to uh, go to a job interview, how to sit down and conduct myself. Now, let's fast forward. I become a, a supervisor in my profession our job was running different programs with different uh, disadvantaged youth coming through. So the way I tried to affect change or help, um, and I'll use this one gentleman, uh, he came through our program and we don't necessarily keep everybody, but he always identified with me. He was like, you know what? I wanna do what you're doing. I said, so what's stopping you from the, well, I got three kids, you know, I'm a baby's mom, da, 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 da. I said, listen, first of all, Establish being a provider and a good father. Let's establish that first. Let's establish that and come into work every day on time doing what you're supposed to do. Forget about what you think you might want to be me. Let's be the best you, right? So let's establish you being a leader in your household, providing for your family and in your community. Now, 10 years later, when I see him, He's on one of our major accounts every day. He thanks me and says, because of you, I was able to take care of my family. I'm able to provide and I'm able to be a focus in my community. My kids look up to me, right? So I don't know if that kind of answers that, but it all comes down to the foundation of what Donald said. You have to lay down foundation and the foundation in our community is encouragement and positive reinforcement. What you have to do that, you have to. 
let me let me let me add on that. Um, so I've been doing a lot of research and reading just as a part of my education, man. And you know, positive reinforcement is is all fine and well. But you know, there's a difference in in positive reinforcement of someone's skill and positive reinforcement of someone's work ethic, right? Like, Absolutely. If, if you if you if you reinforce someone's work ethic, then that person has a, a greater chance of going very far and doing greater things. You, you, you're reinforcing the ethic, the hard work, as opposed to reinforce you know reinforcing oh you know that's that oh that you did a great job on that like that that skit like that artwork looks great. So next time they fail, they may not want to work hard for it. You're not reinfor so reinforcing work ethic is better than just reinforcing you know, someone's skill, right? You know, great job on that artwork. And I say that to say this, like we all have dreams, but one of the biggest challenges that we, I think- You know, we get so, not to interrupt you, not to interrupt you. I think we get so caught up into that we're parents now with, I believe with the exception of Doc, we all get caught up in this whole thing, we're parents. Well, when you're identifying with a young person, they like to know you, we were young at one time. We made the same mistakes. So you, a lot of times we have to be able to identify and when they're able to make that connection that you were there, you weren't all, we weren't always in the position. We weren't always blessed with the, with the material things that we had. We made the same mistakes. You know, we got caught doing the same thing. And when they see that we have to get off of this whole, I'm a parent, I'm, you know, I'm partying the Red Sea and I'm doing this. No, I was a, I was an a-hole. I tripped up. I made mistakes just like you did. And once you find that common thread with them, then you have their attention. That's that's the buy-in. That's the buy-in. When they when they buy into Absolutely. what you are saying, then we it's a team. And I think that's what's important. It has to be us working together, not the parent to the kid. Like I said, I let my son make his choices about what he wants to do. And now he knows what he wants to do. Now my job as the parent is to help him and guide him, direct him to get through it. But I also try to open myself up to any young person. I talk to everybody. I have no problem because I grew up without a father. And in my community, we had some strong black men that took interest in young fellows like me and guided and directed me to what I wanted to do with my life. You know what I mean? They helped me. Yeah. And I try to be that same thing. And that's what we do as, as black men. Make yourselves available. You know what I mean? Open yeah. your door. And it's not always like you said, that the parent talking to the child is us working together to help you achieve your goals, whatever they may be. So the, the, the issue that you all make excellent points. We are talking about community parenting, okay? But you guys have no idea what I've seen. The foundation or the lack of foundation that some of these kids have the parents not being in their lives, the parents care more about being their friend than being their parent. How yes. do you tear, you have to deconstruct, you have to deconstruct that child and then rebuild that child because positive reinforcement, that, that, that's a myth. Mm. I'm not talking about in your individual lives with the people that you have come in contact with individually, my kids, my nieces, my nephews, people that have had interactions with me. I'm what 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 uh, Eric was talking about is how do we reach the kid that doesn't have that foundation, that that is not getting the 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 work ethic from their parents because they're on some type of public assistance and they're selling the food stamps to go get money to get their nails done. How do you change that child's perspective? How do you reach that child? How do you tell that child? that he or she can be anything they want when the only thing they see is a is constant negativity. How do we stop the generational curses that we put on our community? And what we don't have anymore is community parenting. Right, let, me, let me add to that, Donald. Thank you, I, I appreciate that. I'm a firm believer that parents can't do it alone. Our kids don't listen to us, right? They listen, they have, all right, they have listened. But what I tell my son, Donald would tell my son, he, he'll listen to Donald, but not listen to me. Parents can't do it alone. 
That's coming from me, right? right. I think we all agree on that. Like, you, so, so you know, positive reinforcement is fine and well. And as a parent, I'm telling you, when you do positive reinforcement, you want to focus on the skill, the effort, right? Not the the end result. You want to focus on the effort of how they got there because then they work harder. But we need to have organizations out there, like some form of organizations that are going to support these youth, right? Because you can have all the motivation in the world, but if you don't have the grit, the determination to follow through or the, 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 the ability to not be afraid of failure because fear is such a huge roadblock, it's difficult. And so in addition to you being a parent, we have to have our kids out in organizations that are helping support these endeavors, right? Of career explorations, right? Uh, of teaching our youth of what the world of work is like, what interests are out there. Because then they're partnering, right? So they're going to school, they're learning from school, right? They're going to an organization for example, you know, an organization that like Donald's running, right, to get further support. And, and then we have to educate the parents to give the positive reinforcement as well, right? Parents need to support in that way because a kid can go to school, learn a lot of positive things. They can go to work. They can go to an organization and learn a, positive, a ton of positive things and start being up and then they go home and then the parents are like, uh, you know, they're drilling it into them like, oh, well, I don't believe in it and I don't believe in this. My son was in a program the last three years, right? Mm -hmm. for young ma black males. Mm -hmm. Great program. I went to every meeting. We never missed a meeting. Enjoyed it, loved it, watched them grow. What I noticed, there was 26 participants in this program for young black males. Mm -hmm. Out of those 26 participants, there were three males, me and two other fathers, that came to the meeting. Mm -hmm. Every meeting, it was only women. Mm -hmm. It was only women. And it made me really look. And I, you know, I grew up with a mother, but I know the benefits of having men in my life. Mm -hmm. And to see that almost hurt. Because these are young boys, and this program is trying to help them, but these young boys, like you said, they they all over the place. You know what I mean? And just to have a mother. It, it gets rough when they get 15 to 16, man. It, it, it gets rough. And that's where I think one of our problems is right there. These, these black men not being in these kids' lives. There's a, there's a thing in Philadelphia called um, 100 Black Men. And it's a consortium of black men. And all they do is men mentor, okay? And when I tell you, with just to co-sign what Comedian said, 22 kids on my roster, two dads. It is. Maybe three show up. That's 22. It. And what we have been able to do as black men, the three coaches that I coach with in Hunting Park, what we've been able to do is show them that not all black men are criminals, mm -hmm. not all black men are in jail, not all black men, you know, trying to sleep with your mom. And we're laying a foundation that I, I can... If I had to, I could pull two kids that have been with me for 12 years. They could come on here and they would just give you a testimonial of the things that I've done for them in their life yeah. that transcended basketball. Because I had one kid, her dad lives around the corner. This young lady asked me to walk her down the aisle. He lives around the corner. Mm -hmm. She moved. He don't even make the pick up a phone call to say, hey, baby girl, how you doing? You all right? She's 26. Hmm. So come on, man. We know that fathers are not in these kids' lives. OK, that's another whole separate issue. Right. In the sense that we know that that's the case. So. The reason I wanted to have this topic, gentlemen, is because I think that um, you know, it started about purpose, right? Us all having a purpose in this world. And it, 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 it transitioned into like, how do we continue to, you know, help our youth uh, find their purpose, right? Because we all have a purpose. And I truly believe that we need to latch on to these, these youth. Old soul, you're never, too, you're never too old to get out there and start coaching right now. Comedian just started, you know, how many years ago now? Is it, how many? 
six, six, six years. right? So you're never too old to get out there and start doing your coaching where you can make some impact, right? Baller, I believe you're making an impact right now. Um, but I'm sure there's much more that you can continue to do that I can continue to do. Or fellas, maybe Doc, you know, I'm not sure what you're doing out there, but maybe it's something we can do as a group. I don't know, gentlemen, but we need to make an impact. Um, we need to help garner the support of those fathers that are not get them out there and educate them on the importance of it. Right. I, you know, being someone who's, who's going to college, done, done my, my four years, got my master's, you know, and listen, it took me 10 years to graduate to get my bachelor's degree. Cause I was all over the damn place. You know, would I do things differently? Yeah, I, I would do things differently. Did I learn a lot? Am I ashamed about my experience? Not at all. That's why I say it. How can we help youth find out just what what the world of work is like at a young age so that they can start making informed, authentic decisions about the world of work, who they are. So when it comes time to start choosing a major, you know, they're ready. And if they're not after going through all that experience, it's okay. But at least we target them at a young age. We need to start doing that. Yeah, Donald. The way we all got here is the very way that you're going to be able to help someone else. Every experience that we went through is not necessarily for us. The experiences that we went through is so that we can help someone else and get someone else past these experiences. So your 10 year history, your experience of, you know, getting your bachelor's in that information that you are holding on to and that you're being transparent about at this time, that information, if we reach out to a hundred kids and you mentor kids from the time they're 10 to the time they're 16 or 17, 18, just your and all of our individual experiences will be enough to, un, to get them at least thinking about the next step. Because I have children that don't want to go to college. And so we had, there's trade schools out here That's right. that they can go to. That's right. And I had a kid, written, she's like, what is elect, what is an electrician do? I'm like, you mean to tell me you 18 years old and you don't know what an electrician does? Mm-hmm. And I, I gave her the summary, right? It's, there's at least 15 trades that someone can learn. And then in two years, you can be a, a productive person. You don't have to go to a four-year school to accomplish those goals. So it's interesting. We have, uh, we obviously have this format that we can make this happen. Um, let's talk about this topic more for you parents who are actually watching this video. Um, know that, you know, our, our heart is pure. We want to help. We want to help youth. Uh, we want to help give them guidance and, and help them grow into the, the, the brilliant individuals that they are, right? The brilliant individuals that they are. And so, um, please just continue to make sure that you support your, your son, your daughter, um, get them to organizations that are doing work in the community to help them grow and, and know that, um, you can make a difference, right? And if you're interested in reaching out to any of us, big dot, so Darius, me, uh, the fat check of Vance Anderson, also Carl Tyler, Kevin Davis, the comedian, Barry Young, the baller, and, and uh, Frank Adams here, the preacher, um, do so. Because, listen, we just want to make an impact in this world. And this is why we do what we do. Um, the youth are our future, right? They will be here, <laughs> hopefully, preaching, you know, oh, not, not hopefully in the future, making a big difference and not having to say the same things over and over again. It's okay. But, um, you know, hopefully they're here because they are our future, our future presidents. Right. And, um, we love you all. My brothers, my brothers, my brothers, my brothers, my brothers. Video podcast.